Julian McMahon uh, is an impassioned what language is advocate in the most desperate of circumstances, as many of you, I'm sure all of you would know. He's a barrister, a Melbourne barrister. He'd become most, not most uh, important, but most perhaps best known uh, in Australia for his advocacy of the Andrew Chan and Muren Sukumaran in the uh, recent, or up to the recent, their recent execution. He's been involved in, as he puts it, uh, looking after people who no one else really wants to defend. He's a remarkable advocate, and I've once heard him speak about this extraordinary experience, an extraordinary act of devotion of uh, going to Indonesia and trying to save the lives of these people. And you can hear, this is not just a sort of technical legal business, having an advocate. It's a matter, in this case, of life and death, and it's always a matter of importance, and I'm very glad that Julian is here to tell us something about it. Hmm. Hello. My head's spinning because um, I thought I had a few good things to say, and that listening to the last uh, few speakers, I just want to keep listening to them and talk about what they're talking about. Uh, for instance, I was thinking when Judy was speaking, uh, now in, uh, I do, my main area of work is probably murder and terrorism these days. And um, in murder cases now, in, in sentencing, the idea that a murder that is in the, in the house is in any way less serious than any other terrible murder has just completely disappeared. Mm. You know, the law has changed so much, probably in 15 years, really. And um, I was thinking, also, when we're hearing about prisoners leaving prison, I mean, what a disgrace it is to our community that you can walk out of prison as a young woman and have nothing and nobody. When we look at where all the money goes, I, I know of one case where a prisoner walked out, he'd been on medication, serious medication, he walked out without the medication. Uh, nowhere to go, no money, no medication, no one interested, and he's literally dumped out the front. And um, of course, it wasn't long before he's back in prison. Um, about two weeks ago, yes, I think it's two weekends ago, I was, because of bad timing, I'm not very good at my calendar, I was in uh, Indonesia for the weekend. I had a trial going, so I had to fly out and fly back. And um, looking at you reminds me so much of that because the lights were in my face and I couldn't see the people I was talking to. And it was an ASEAN literary conference. And my job there was to talk about um, arts and the law in a way and it was, it was a very moving experience for me in a way because there was so much courage from all the young writers and uh, poets and um, other people in the arts. Um, I'm not sure whether there were singers there but it's really exactly the same point and, and, and my lecture there was really about the role of the writer or, or the poet or the dramatist in challenging um, unjust societies and and but I was talking to a room full of people who really live that and and who face um, many of them face persecution and pressure um, for speaking up about things exactly the kind of things we've been talking about today the rule of law and um, fighting injustice or uh, corruption and so on um, so with that wild introduction uh, I, I, I'm going to br talk briefly about the death penalty, but also I just want to throw up some ideas because I think we're going to have perhaps almost an hour for questions. So um, yes. I'll throw up some ideas about um, uh, things that I think are important for communities and justice. Um, but I'll, I'll talk briefly about the death penalty, which um, no, you know, no one really wants to hear about on a Saturday morning, but. For the last uh, couple of weeks especially, but over months really, a number of people in different countries have been trying to help a, 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 a guy in, in Singapore called uh, Ko Jia Bing. I haven't looked at today's paper, so I don't know if it's in the paper, but he was a young man caught up in a, in a violent robbery of a bloke on the street. And it, the, the facts were pretty unclear, uh, but the victim died, and so it was a murder case in Singapore. And 
uh, yesterday afternoon he was executed in Singapore. And uh, the lead up to it, you know, uh, there have been many court cases about him. The, the, the case has a, there's a sense of a screaming injustice in that case. And there are six judges in different courts who have studied the facts of the case. And three of them said he should not die because of the uncertainty of the various facts and tests not being um, met and so on, legal tests. And three said that he should die. And then apart from those six judges, there were numerous appeals and so on. Yesterday, today's Saturday. So Thursday, there was an urgent appeal in the afternoon, Thursday afternoon. Um, and then that failed. And then there was another appeal late on Thursday night. And they said, OK, well, if you file by 11, we'll hear your appeal. They filed by 11 p.m. And it, the appeal was heard at 9 a.m. The barrister running the case said, look, these are really difficult, complex constitutional issues and administrative law issues and so on. Um, this really just shouldn't be going ahead at this speed. And they said, well, it's on now, um, carry on. Uh, unsurprisingly, because I've already told you the outcome, um, he lost the case. Uh, and uh, the fellow, young fellow was executed a few hours later. And the reason I'm telling you that story is, is you know, it, for lawyers, it's confronting to see, you know, there's usually, not always, but usually where there's speed with punishment, something's going wrong, uh, whether it's in our legal system or any system. Um, usually speed and thoughtful, um, just outcomes don't travel well together. Uh, and nor does secrecy and law. Uh, but I'm going to leave the death penalty shortly, but j just to put it in context for you, because um, slightly depressing concept for me, but I'll probably be um, significantly engaged in death penalty work for some time. Uh, I recently was just become the president of a small NGO called Reprieve, which deals with death penalty work. And just looking around our region, you know, in the last few weeks, now most of you won't know this because it's not newsworthy. Um, and even in the countries that I'm talking about, it's not newsworthy. But in the last few weeks, uh, Japan executed two people. Uh, Malaysia executed a few people. Taiwan executed. Uh, Singapore executed. Uh, Indonesia. We don't even know how many people Singapore executed yesterday, whether it was one or two. Um, I can pretty much guarantee even an audience of people so concerned about things that they would get up on a Saturday morning to come and listen to speakers probably don't know that three people were executed in Malaysia a few weeks ago. And Indonesia, which has been in the press a bit more, uh, is planning to execute 14 people. Now, that's one I've been following very closely. So you can imagine if you're a prisoner on death row in Indonesia, you'd be following it pretty closely too. Who are the 14 people who are going to be executed? Uh, not named. Speculation. A whole bunch of people on death row are on Nusa Kambangan Island, which is where people do get executed. But there's plenty of reliable guesses, but their names aren't identified. When are they going to get executed? Not known. Government's response, well, we're going to execute pretty soon, maybe when it stops raining, or maybe before Ramadan, or maybe after, or we'll see if there are any other legal appeals that any of them want to take, and um, we'll get around to it pretty soon. That's, the, that's literally the state of play. So you don't know whether you're going to die, and you don't know when. You don't know whether you're on the list. The list is not public. And, it, and, and, and so that's the state of play in Ind Indonesia today. And in the last few weeks, there's been enormous scramble with some people trying to get um, through the court system. Now, I'm not making this accusation, but other people do, that some of those cases involve very bad things with regard to the rule of law, um, profound injustices. And um, I don't know enough about the detail to, to confidently say what they are. I mean, you can guess and I know roughly what they are, but they're not my cases to be able to be precise, but there's a lot of worry and drama about some of those cases. 
So the reality is we're sitting here in Melbourne or Bendigo uh, and all around us, people are uh, in, in the countries around us and our f countries that are our friends, people are uh, getting executed. And if the new president of the Philippines is to be believed, he plans to execute um, 100,000 people in the next six months, uh, which is what he said. And I think he uh, is planning for most of them to be public. Uh, he like, wants public executions. And if you go a little bit further afield, you know, countries like Pakistan execute four people a week. Uh, China executes uh, an unknown number of people a day uh, because it's a state secret. Um, in the last 10 years, the numbers have varied enormously from up to 8,000 in a year, which is about, I think, one, in, one an hour. Uh, and there's been a lot of scandal attached to that. You know, the Canadians have had a close look at it and um, there's the whole issue of um, executions being related to the availability of body parts on demand for um, health tourism. So, you know, there's a lot of ugly issues there. But how many people get executed in China now is, is anyone's guess. Probably maybe 2,000 a year is the sort of number that is now floating around. And America executes not exactly one a week, but more than one a fortnight. Uh, and it's changing too. So it's just one of the many human rights issues that we all have to confront. Um, but it's, it's not linked to Australia in our justice system, but it's linked exactly to the ideas that we're talking about because uh, one of the things that focusing on the death penalty really brings home um, is that it, it shines a light on many other things that are happening around the death penalty, like the abuse of power. Um, so the three people in Malaysia who got executed recently got told on a Thursday that they're going to be sh uh, hung the next day. Um, so, you know, I don't know what the right words are for that, but kind of distasteful or um, shocking, confronting and so on. And the only reason the world found out about it, really, is because one of the families got a letter about two days earlier, which they took to, I think it was Amnesty, and so suddenly it was, the, the, it was exposed. Um, in Japan, the lack of accountability and the lack of interest in the rights of prisoners, the treating them as something less than um, equivalent to all of us as humans and having you know, human rights that matter. Um, you can be on death row for a long time, decades, and at every minute of that time, you don't know whether you're going to be executed that day. Um, you're allowed very few visits. The prison conditions for people on death row, I could spend 10 minutes telling you about them and you probably just wouldn't believe me. <coughs> Pardon? Well, you, you, you sit in a cell. You're not allowed to move around your cell. Um, you have an extremely limited number of stimulants. Uh, you have, I think, a radio set on a station that the guards set for you. You're allowed a very limited number of books. Um, no one speaks to you. You're not allowed to speak to the guards. So you live in silence, except for the radio, whatever it is. You have exercise for very short periods, uh, I think a couple of times a week. So the effect of being on death row in Japan is that you will go mad. It's just a question of when. Um, now Japan's executed about 20 people in the last four years. And, uh, you know, we're great friends with Japan, and um, so we should be. But we should be bringing these issues up as well. You know, about two weeks ago, we signed a multi-billion dollar contract with Singapore. Or I don't know about signing a contract. We entered into an arrangement between two countries for them to be working uh, up in our, uh, one of the Queensland army bases doing a whole lot of training. I think that's a good thing. You know, Singapore is a stable state and it's got its flaws like every state, but it also has many good characteristics. Um, for instance, racial harmony, religious freedom and things like that really matter in that part of the world. You don't have to go far from Singapore to wish you were living in the conditions that Singaporeans live in. But when it comes to criminal justice, um, they're, they're miles behind, miles and miles behind. They still have brutal floggings. 
I'm not talking about a flogging where someone gets hurt. I'm talking about a flogging where the flesh goes flying and where your body is permanently damaged. Uh, I'm not suggesting you do it, but you know you can find it on the internet if you have to crawl down in that kind of mud. Um, but it's disgraceful that it happens. Um, uh, you know, we're talking about a country where most of the leadership is educated places like here or Harvard or Oxford um, presiding over that kind of um, completely unnecessary uh, cruelty and brutality. So in the context of thinking about all that, we also think about rehabilitation. One of the reasons everyone, when I say everyone, probably everyone in Australia just about did know about Myra and Sukumara and Andrew Chan, but one of the reasons they gathered so much support was not because of the more important underlying argument about um, people share human rights precisely because we're human and those rights should entitle us not to be killed in a premeditated fashion by anyone, including the state. But what attracted attention really was their rehabilitation and um, Deborah's talking about you know, what happens in programs in prisons. Well, in, in one of the, the, the really sad things about killing Sukumaran and Chan was um, the rehabilitation work they did in the Bali prison was truly phenomenal. And right now people are writing PhDs on it and planning to make films about it. That was quite something. They, if you imagine the prison being the shape of this room, meant to hold 350 people, holds 1,000 people, and the gangs run the show. Uh, you know, in, in a way that kind of you can think about from the movies rather than any experience that you would have had in your normal life. Um, gangs are very big in Bali and they're very big in the prison. And with gangs, there's all kinds of things that you would understand intimidation, power, and so on. Now, in the middle of all that, um, Sukumaran, who was a big guy and everyone was frightened of him, although he, he wasn't um, violent, but people thought he was um, scary because he was, compared to most of the people, if not all the people around him, he was a big guy. And all the Australians up there, as you would expect from their life of movies and TV, as soon as they hit prison, they hit the weights and train up and get fit. Um, so in the corner of the prison, in an area big, as big as a few classrooms, they created, over about six or seven years, they created a TAFE. Uh, they ran art classes, computer classes, um, English classes and many, many other kinds of things like that. And, and most of you will realise the painting of Myron Sukumaran ended up becoming the prominent public feature of all that. But there were many other activities going on. And out of that, the prisoners were leaving prison with um, certificates, some of them provided by uh, university structures, um, with skills. You know, these are people born into poverty, living in poverty, because uh, overwhelmingly the prisons uh, in Bali, the prisoners are of poor and marginalised people. Um, you know, just park that idea because one of Deborah's slides really just said exactly that. The prisons are filled with poor and marginalised people. Uh, so killing them was to say, well, this is an amazingly good program that's running in the prison. It's supported by international artists like Ben Quilty, um, lawyers from everywhere, d dancers, singers, teachers, you name it, they're coming into the prison teaching these kids, um, not just kids, young men and, and men of all ages really I suppose, skills. And, and, and we know that those prisoners are leaving and setting up art studios outside the prison and gaining jobs. So there was, there was incredible affection from a whole body of the prisoners who moved from being um, in terrible circumstances to being people who were um, drug-free, employed, with self-respect. And, you know, I know of one example. One prisoner was trying to substitute his life for Andrew Chan's life, saying, you know, this mustn't stop. And even in those last few months of their life, you know, they'd be they'd be hitting everybody, every wealthy Western to come in, you know, getting 
money or assistance to help other prisoners. Myron was busy selling his paintings, raised thousands of dollars, and the money goes straight to hospitals to fund operations for prisoners who have no money because there's no health care up there that's free. Now, that's the kind of stuff that was destroyed. And since they were killed, um, almost everybody who's been related to it has been moved out. The gangs are taking over and things have gone very badly backwards. So I've got to speak for three or four more minutes, I think. I've already gone way over. I wanted to really talk about what I'm now about to talk about, which is um, um, just a combination of ideas because, you know, we'll all be gone later today and we, we go our different ways. But this idea of the rule of law, which I can't now talk about in the presence of a professor on the rule of law, but uh, <laughs> to me, you know, it's like a bundle of ideas and, uh, you know, it includes things like there's no corruption, that the judges will be um, impartial and not influenced by outside influences. And it includes things like you can go to the police station and you'll be safe. Uh, which is untrue in many countries in our region. Um, and, you know, Judy's already covered kind of fundamentals about women's rights and feminism. Um, now, in that, there's no guarantee that it will persist. And if you... So my, my real point today, uh, which I wanted to develop and I haven't done very well at all, is... If we, if we look at the death penalty countries and the things that are associated with that, and we look at the good things in our country, and then we look at the bad things in our country, some of the critical things that separate us from what is much worse, but are constantly at risk, um, relate to the tensions around the rule of law. You know, if every defence barrister stopped working tomorrow, uh, then in five years our country would be unrecognisable. Um, there's always this constant tension going on in the courts and it disciplines the police to not overreach. And what's scary about our country and, and, and other democracies is no guarantee that it will continue. And if you look at um, some of the aspects of what we criticise um, I'm not talking about government policy on refugees, but you know the idea that the whole border force regime is suddenly, broadly speaking, secret. Um, we don't really know what's going on in our name. Um, the idea that the process of losing citizenship, broadly speaking, has become secret. Uh, the phenomenon of, um, of, of Donald Trump can show, I think, is kind of show how badly things can go, how quickly they can go. So I'm going to throw the idea out, then I'll stop. But the rule of law is central to what protects us and what makes us a good country. It must travel with a free press, which I haven't spoken about at all. But the two things that we need to fight for and preserve most of all a rule of law and free press. And if you look at all of the media in the last two days, you'll find some examples of the press really being challenged around the whistleblower stuff. And that's where you come in because, when I say you, I, I, I don't mean you, but that's where the community comes in because if we don't fight all the time for the freedom of the press and everything that that means, in terms of ideas and challenging lies and so on, and the rule of law and everything that means, then we have to remember there's no guarantee that our country will um, prosper and be worth living in in the future. And I can pretty much guarantee it won't be. Like many countries that we see, uh, you, you'd, you'd run a mile if, you, if someone said, why don't you go and live there? And so community engagement, which is what this weekend is all about and what we've seen in Bendigo in recent times, frankly, um, community engagement is critical to preserving and building on what exists that's worth um, protecting and, and fighting for. And in that context, we should be thinking about freedom of the press all the time and rule of law all the time, because those are the two that are, in my opinion, together with respect and courtesy, which was about the second third of my speech, which I now will not be delivering. <laughs> um, but I'd like to talk about respect and courtesy as well, because with r rule of law and freedom of the press and community engagement, 
Central to all of that too is respect and courtesy because where they lack or get diminished or get trampled on, what I see is um, prisoners being badly treated, whether it's in our solitary confinement or when they leave the door of the prison or they get hung or shot somewhere. So um, the plan of my speech was to throw out these ideas for further discussion. Thank you very much.